We good? All right. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. So welcome, everyone, uh, to our morning worship service. Glad to have everyone here, uh, here in the auditorium or with us online. If you're visiting with us, we want to extend a special welcome to you. Ask that you fill out a visitor's card that you'll find on the back of the pew in front of you and place that in the collection plate, which will be on the uh, table in the foyer where you picked up your communion kit on the way in. We do our normal announcements at the end of service, so let us begin this morning with uh, a word of prayer. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we are so thankful to you for being our God, for being our Creator, for being the loving being that you, that you are and extending your grace and your mercy to us, Father. We thank you, Father, for your Son, Jesus, and the hope of eternal life that we have through him and the sacrifice he made on that cruel cross for us. We pray, Father, that as we enter into our worship hour, now with you, that we will clear our hearts and minds of things of this world that will distract us, that we will fully focus in, with a reverent heart on praising and glorifying you to the best of our abilities. We pray, Father, that our worship to you will be acceptable, that we will be strengthened, and that you will be pleased with the things said and done here this morning. We pray, Father, you will please be with this congregation as we are suffering from many who are ill either due to COVID or other medical issues. We pray, Father, that you'll please be with them and help them to recover, help them to, to receive the medical care that they so desperately need. We pray, Father, also that you'll be with those who are grieving at this time, and we know that list is also growing. Father, we know that all things work together for good for those that, that love you, those that follow you, and we pray, Father, that we always look to that as our a source of strength and guidance. Father, we pray that you'll please be with the, the leadership here at this congregation that to make wise decisions that will foster growth, that will help us to be a, a better presence in this community, and that we will bear more fruit for you, both locally and throughout the world, and all the efforts that we support. Pray, Father, that you'll please be with the leaders of this nation. Help us to help them to make decisions that will foster peace so that the gospel may be spread. Again, Father, as we humbly approach you and worship this hour, we pray that our thoughts and minds will be focused on the proper things. And Father, we pray that when this life is over, we'll be found faithful in that day of judgment so we can be with you for eternity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. First song this morning is number 287, number 287. If you're joining us online, we're singing from the Songs of the Church. Number 287 is In Vain and High and Holy Lays, otherwise known as Wonderful Love. Number 287. In vain and high and holy lays My soul her graceful voice would raise For who can sing the worthy praise Of the wonderful love of Jesus Wonderful love, wonderful love Wonderful love of Jesus Wonderful love, wonderful love Wonderful love of Jesus, a joy by day, a peace by night, in storms a calm and darkness light, in pain a balm and weakness might is the wonderful love of Jesus. Wonderful love, wonderful love, wonderful love of Jesus. Wonderful love, wonderful love, wonderful love of Jesus. My hope for pardon when I call, my trust for lifting when I fall. In life and death, my all in all is the wonderful love of Jesus. Wonderful love, wonderful love. Wonderful love of Jesus, wonderful love, wonderful love, wonderful love of Jesus. 
If you would at this time take your song books and mark number 668. Number 668, Come to Jesus. Number 668. That'll be the song following the sermon this morning, number 668. And then if you would turn to number 427. Number 427, praise the Lord. Number 427. And if it is convenient, if you would, please be standing for the singing of the song, number 427. <clears throat> praise the Lord, ye hands adore him. Praise him, angels in the high. Sun and moon rejoice before him. Praise him, all ye stars of light. Hallelujah. chapter 17, and I'll be reading verses, verses 15 through 21. Again, that's Judges 17, 15 through 21, and I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Then she said to him, How can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You have mocked me these three times, and I have not been told where your great strength lies. And it came to pass, when she pestered him daily with her words and, and pressed him so that his soul was vexed to death, that he told her all, all his heart and said to her, No razor has ever come to my head. Now I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaven, then my strength will leave me, and I will become weak and like any other man. When Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent calling uh, and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up once more. For he has told me all his heart. So the lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought her the money in their hand. Then she lulled him to sleep on her knee and called for, him, for a man and had him shave off the seven locks on his head. Then she began to torment him, and his strength left him. She said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he woke from his sleep and said, I will go out as before at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. Then the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza, where they bound him in bronze fetters, and he became a grinder in the prison.
Let me add my welcome to all of you who are here this morning. It's good to see all of you. And I do know we have some people that I believe it's their first time to visit with us. We are glad that you are here. And we'll hope maybe you'll kind of loiter as you go out the doorway and shake our hands and give us a chance to know a little bit about you. We're glad that you're here. Well, the story that was read, it's a familiar story. It is a story about what very well may be the strongest man to ever walk the face of this earth, the man Samson. You know, we're fascinated with strength. <laughs> a few years ago, from time to time, I would watch the World's Strongest Man competition. And they did amazing things. They tossed barrels around like they were basketballs. They hooked themselves up to cars and trucks maybe even trains, and were able to pull them along. But the strength of those people on those TV shows was nothing compared to the documented strength that we find of Samson in the Bible. Maybe if we think of things that he would compare to, maybe it would be Hercules. The difference, of course, is significant. One is Hercules is just a fabled character. Samson was real, and the strength that he had was real, and the feats that he performed were real. And some of them were truly amazing. You know, there were four or five we could easily give as examples. Let me give you a couple of them. Judges 14, as Samson was traveling, to his surprise, a young lion came roaring against him. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he tore the lion apart as one who would have torn apart a young goat. I would be pretty impressed with somebody who tore apart a young goat, actually. <laughs> tore apart a lion. President Theodore Roosevelt, in his book about his adventures in Africa, said that ordinarily the lion is the most dangerous opponent of a hunter. But the Bible says Samson just tore the lion apart with his bare hands. And then one occasion when his enemies tried to capture him, I think is one of the most amazing stories. And that is he went into the enemy city of Gaza, but he heard that the people were going to try to capture him, to ambush him. Judges 16, 3, and Samson lay low till midnight. Then he arose at midnight, took hold of the doors of the gates of the city and the gate posts, pulled them up, bar and all, put them on his shoulders, and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. He didn't just knock the gates down. He lifted up at least the doors of the gates, put him on, put him on his back, and went some distance, and not on level territory, like our parents used to tell us about walking to school. It was up at home. It was uphill both ways. He carried the gates uphill to the top of the hill. So amazing were his feats. Maybe he reminds us more of the TV character Superman. And I will tell you, when I was a little boy, that black and white, 30-minute editions. But when I got home, I grabbed my snack, I guess, and I made a beeline for the TV because I did not want to miss that 30-minute episode of Samson. Amazing things, not Samson, but Superman. And another fictional character, of course. But he did some amazing things. They were fun to watch. It, it, was, it was interesting to me. One thing I remember was there would be somebody shooting at him, and he just stood there, and the bullets just bounced off at him, of him. But what happened next was the person who had been shooting at him threw his gun at Superman, and Superman ducked. So the guy, the bullets from the gun didn't work, so he thought, well, I'll just hit him with the gun. I, the logic of that fails me. And then Superman, who took the bullets anyhow, leaned over because he didn't want to be hit with a gun. But there was something that made Superman weak. Do you remember what that was? It's kryptonite. It was that green stone or that green jewel. If he let kryptonite get close to him, he became weak. The closer it got, the weaker he got. So then, in effect, one of the strongest people, the fictional person, Superman, became one of the weakest people. Kryptonite was the thing that made a strong man weak. And it was here that maybe there is another parallel in the story of Samson, the biblical, the real biblical character of Samson. There were things in his life that made him weak. In the end, you know it was the cutting of his hair, but there were other things that were steps down his road to destruction. Just like Superman lost his strength when kryptonite came into his life, Samson lost his strength because some things came into his life. I want to look at three of those this morning. 
Because I think we can see parallel. I think the things that came into his life that made him weak, Samson weak, if they get into our lives, they're going to make us weak too. They may not make us weak physically, but they are going to make us weak spiritually. Three things that are kryptonite to anyone who wants to live the Christian life. The first thing that Samson had that he let into his life was he lost his self-control. He had weak self-control. If you have strong self-control, then you're in control. But that was not the case with Samson. He was out of control. And we can see that from several, several things in his life. He had lost his self-control when it came to women. In the very beginning of the story, Samson told his father and mother, this is Judges 14, 2, I have seen a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me as wife. Then his father and mother said to him, Is there no woman among the daughters of your brethren or among all my people that you must go out and get a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she pleases me well. Samson had no self-control. He had no self-restraint. He was certainly not controlled by his parents. He was controlled by God. The woman was a Philistine, not an Israelite. And you know in that era, God had very strict laws about who the people could associate with, especially those with whom they could intermarry. Deuteronomy chapter 7, when they went into the land and captured the land, they were supposed to get rid of the people that were there. They certainly were not supposed to intermarry with them. And that's exactly what Samson wanted to do. He was clearly not under his father's control. He just ignored his father's advice. What Samson wanted, he thought he must have. He lost his self-control. There's another indication that he lost his self-control, and that was his temper. Um, He had made a bet with some people, and the bet was 30 changes of clothes. Well, he lost the bet. Judges 14, 19... When he had done that, Samson went down to Ashkelon and killed 30 of their men, took their apparel, and gave the changes of clothes to those who had explained the riddle, so his anger was aroused. A person who is not in control of his temper is not in control of his life. I mean, we think it's bad, and we know it's bad to lose our temper, but do we realize that when we lose our temper, we lose control? Anybody who can make us angry can control us. How embarrassing is it if that happens to realize that we are just like the puppet on the ends of the strings. They know how to yank those chains. They know how to control us. The wise man Solomon said, Proverbs 25, 28, whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. In that era, if a city had no walls, anybody could come in, anybody could could conquer it and control it. Samson was like that when he lost his self-control. So the first thing that Samson let into his life that became a part of the kryptonite that made him weak was he lost his self-control. Second thing that was kryptonite in his life was he had weak morals. And there are many manifestations of this, one we may not often think about, but the moral code that God had revealed was that each person should be considerate of other people. He was not that way. Samson was not that way. He showed he was willing to disregard anything that might be good for anybody else in order to have what he wanted. He had not had the consideration for others that, according to God's laws, he was supposed to have. Also, the other thing that showed his weak moral integrity was he was a liar. When Delilah pretended three times that she knew what the secret of his strength was, three times he told her something that was not true. Now, there's no doubt that Delilah is an evil woman. Uh, Samson had no business associating with her. But in that situation, for example, he could have just refused to tell her, but he lied to her. Maybe that's just a reminder to us that a lie told to a bad person is still a lie. If we're lying to somebody, then we are a liar. He was a thief. When he lost the bet about the 30 changes of clothes, he stole them for 30 men. He was a thief. And what was a part of stealing them? He was a murderer because he had them killed. Now, I believe from the overall context of the story of Samson, it's clear that God gave him his strength so he could fight against the Philistines. That was one of the enemies of God's people. But killing those 30 men, that was not honorable combat in the name of Jehovah God. That was a personal deed that he did for a selfish reason. 
Samson violated God's moral code. He murdered. He lied. He murdered. I saw a saying somewhere over the past several weeks that said, God will not tolerate the things that his son died to eliminate. God will not tolerate the things that his son died to eliminate. Christ died to eliminate murder and stealing and lying. We cannot try to, in our lives or in his life, rationalize circumstances. It's wrong in the life of Samson. It's wrong in our lives. We cannot rationalize circumstances that make those things okay. God will not tolerate the things that his son died to eliminate. Christ died to eliminate murder and stealing and lying. We can't condone them today. Another example of Samson's weak morals was, of course, his sexual immorality. And I think in the beginning of the story in chapter 14, we get the idea that he was probably not a very moral person. But the language in chapter 16 loses no doubt that not only was he not a moral man, but he purposely sought out immoral women. Then there was Delilah, other strong implications of immoral sexual relationship. And if you think about the context, if you think about the overall story of the teachings of the Bible, it seems like sexual immorality must be one of the most disgusting sins in the eyes of God. When God was angry with Israel, he compared their unfaithfulness to sexual immorality. Now, part of it because they were supposed to be faithful to God, and they began to be unfaithful to God and faithful with other idolatrous things. But still, the comparison was with sexual immorality. When Paul wrote to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 6, he wrote about how this kind of behavior defiles the body that God gave us. Samson's sexual conduct, another example of his weak morals. So another chunk of kryptonite that Samson had led into his life was his weak morality. Lying, stealing, sexual immorality. Those are just as much kryptonite to us today as they were to Samson back then. They will weaken us. They should not be part of our lives. Paul, Romans 1, 29, rebuked those who were filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. <laughs> there are some of those things, the sexual immorality, murder, deceit, stealing. They showed that Samson had weak morals. Another piece of kryptonite that got close to him that made him weak. And the third thing that led to Samson losing his strength, I would suggest to you, was weak reasoning. Now, some of these other things might also be involved in this, but he, he, did not, he was not very wise in the decisions that he made. He had poor reasoning. Now, I'm not suggesting the old stereotype that it's because the body was strong, you know, the mind would have been weak. Not at all. Samson was a clever man. He was the one who came up with a riddle that fooled everyone, Judges 14, 14. Out of the eater came something to eat. Out of the strong came something sweet. Samson was no dummy. But when it came to logical and reasonable, about being reasonable about the influence in his life, he showed he was not very wise. In the context of the whole story, he essentially fell into a trap that he had seen three times before. Judges 16, Delilah's trying to get him to tell the source of the strength. First, he told us that if he was bound in seven fresh bowstrings, what'd she do? She went and got the seven fresh bowstrings, had him bound, but of course, he was able to break out of that. She continued to pester him, and then he told her, well, the secret was new ropes. You bind me with new ropes, then I will be held. That was not the case either. Then she told him all it took was weaving his hair, and sure enough, she wove his hair, but that did not make him weak. It seems to me that even a person who was a little bit slow to catch on would have figured out by now I should not be trusting this woman. <laughs> she is in league with my enemies, and he's, she's here to do me in. But after three times of having the opportunity to blatantly see that she was trying to cause him harm, he finally told her the real secret of his strength, having his head shaved. And true to the pattern you know, I've said before, I think a lot of wisdom in this world is pattern recognition. Samson was not good at pattern recognition. 
he told her, and then they captured Samson. So even after three warnings of the danger, he walked into the trap. It just seems crazy that he would be taken in by something he'd seen so many times before. It was like three times Delilah said, just come on in here. I've got the kryptonite in here. <laughs> Finally, he walked in there. So one of the real reasons that Samson lost his physical strength was his weak reasoning ability. That would seem amazing, wouldn't it? But don't we know people like that today? People who have been warned time and time again about the danger of a situation. Warned about situations that they should that they should try to stay away from, like using drugs, like gambling, like cheating, like being overly physical affection with somebody who's not your spouse. Situation like drinking alcoholic beverages. Warned about too much time we spend with those who do not share our high values. I know that's something I've tried to emphasize a lot of times. I don't think we take it as seriously as we should. Spending most of our time around people who do not share our values. It seems like just in general that would be a problem, but especially those of us who are trying to stay faithful to Christian principles. Can we have other friends? Absolutely. But the Bible teaches us we need to watch out for those other kinds of companions. Our best friends ought to be Christian friends. We ought to be spending the most of our time around people who share our high values, around people who share our Christian values. So we see these people. They heard the warnings. <laughs> they heard the warnings many times today. They probably were warned by their parents. They're warned by their friends. Maybe they're warned by Bible class teachers. Maybe they're warned in a sermon. But many of these people have even seen their friends hurt by the same set of circumstances. And yet sometimes they just willingly walk right into it like they don't know what's going to happen. That's not wise. It's a weak reasoning ability. So if you know people like that, it just doesn't seem very wise, does it? They have been warned time and time and time again. And yet one day walk, somebody walks up to them and says, oh, why don't you do this? Oh, let's go do that, and they do it. Much in the same way that Samson finally gave in and told the secret of his strength. Solomon said, Proverbs 14, 15, the simple. Maybe that's not a word we use very often today, but the simple-minded, those who are simple, means they just do not have the same kind of mental strength and capacity. Solomon says the simple believes every word. But the prudent considers his steps. He doesn't want to wind up, wind up stepping in a bad place. Maybe those simple people that Solomon talks about reminds us of Samson. He knew the kryptonite was there. It was the well-established pattern. His weak reasoning ability was the source of kryptonite, the source of kryptonite that he had let into his life that caused him to lose his strength. Weak reasoning ability. So we looked at three things that I'm suggesting to you in a parallel with Superman were kryptonite. Things that Samson led into his life that led to him becoming weak. One thing he led into his life was self-control. He let self-control, he, he let weak self-control into his life when he failed to have strong self-control over himself. You know, I think one of the most important things we teach our children today is, 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 is discipline. They need to learn self-discipline. They need to learn self-control. My belief is if they do not learn control, to be in subjection to control from their parents, they're going to have a hard time learning self-control. And if they don't learn self-control, it's very difficult for them to live a life as pleasing to God. So, the things that Samson led into his life, weak self-control, weak morals. How many times does the Bible warn us about morals, morals? Weak reasoning. And I don't know whether we've thought about it in that kind of term before, but we need to be wise. A part of being wise is recognizing the pattern of things around us. We need to watch out for these same three types of kryptonite. They will take away our strength. They take away our strength. 
They will take away our moral strength. They will take away our spiritual strength. Just like kryptonite took away the strength of Superman and the same way these kinds of kryptonite took away the strength of Samson. If we're Christians and we have let some of that kryptonite into our life, that green kryptonite, <laughs> upon own colors, not upon, serious teaching, you get rid of the effects of the green kryptonite by the red blood of Jesus Christ. You must use the antidote. John 1, 7, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sins. If you're a Christian and you've let some of that into your life, you need to get rid of it. You need to get back on the path. You need to repent and pray like the example we have in Acts 8, 22. If you're not a Christian, then your access to the blood the Bible teaches is a slightly different kind of way. One, you have to believe in God, and of course you have to believe in Christ. You have to believe in Christ for who he was. You've got to let that knowledge change your hearts. Jesus said in Luke 13, 3, unless you repent, you're going to perish. I don't know if people take that as seriously as they should. Repent is a change of mind, a change of will. Talk to somebody like the people in Alcoholics Anonymous who are trying to overcome a bad habit in their minds, in their lives. If they do not first change their will, if they don't have that repentance, that change of heart, Nothing else is going to change. And so it is when people try to turn from the lives they've been living to living a Christian life. Repentance, Luke 13, 3. Then confess, we need to acknowledge the source of that salvation. Acknowledge Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God. And of all of those, maybe the easiest is the last one. And that is a person who needs to be baptized. That's not what I say. That's what the scriptures say. Mark 16, 16, Jesus says to be baptized. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. There's a link there between baptism and salvation. Acts 2, 38, we understand the link. The apostle Peter explains that baptism is for the remission of sins. 1 Peter 3, 21, the apostle Peter later says, just simply, baptism doth also now save us. I have heard people that teach that, well, the Bible doesn't say that baptism saves you. Well, look at 1 Peter 3.21. That verse is in the scriptures. It must mean something. It says baptism saves us. That's how we ac access the blood of Christ. The forgiveness is available in the blood of Christ. But that's not the end. That's just the beginning. Then we need to live lives that are consistent with the principles that we hear in the Bible and one thing we need to do to be unable to live that life is to avoid those things that will make us spiritually weak. We must be very careful with our self-control, be very careful with our morals. And yeah, we need to be careful with our reasoning ability. The things that God has asked us to do, he says they're reasonable. That means we can come to the right conclusion with the reasonable abilities that we have, with the reasoning abilities that we have. If we don't use those, we're going to wind up on the wrong path. If there's some way we can help some of you this morning, we'd be glad to have an opportunity to try to do that if you'll come forward as we sing. If you give your heart to Jesus, he will make it white as snow. Come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come today. Come to Jesus, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus, come, come today. Come to Jesus, do not tarry. Enter in at mercy's gate. Oh, delay not till the morrow, lest thy coming be too late. Come to Jesus, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus, come today. Come to Jesus, come to Jesus. 
come to Jesus, come, come today. Come to Jesus, dying sinner, other Savior there is none. He will share with you his glory when your pilgrimage is done. Come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to Come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come, come today. Please be seated. Before we share in the Lord's Supper together, let us sing number 507, number 507, 10,000 angels, number 507. They bound the hands of Jesus in the garden where he prayed. They led him through the streets in shame. They spat upon the Savior so pure and free from sin. They said, crucify him, he's to blame. To destroy the world and set him free. He could have called ten thousand angels, but he died alone for you and me. Upon his precious head, they placed a crown of thorns. They laughed and said, Behold the King. They struck him and they cursed him and they mocked his holy name. All alone he suffered everything. He could have called ten thousand angels to destroy the world and set him free. He could have called ten thousand angels, but he died alone for you and me. To the howling mob he yielded, he did not for mercy cry. The cross of shame he took to die. Salvation's wondrous plan was done. He could have called ten thousand angels to destroy the world and set him free. He could have called ten thousand angels, but he died alone. Not able to grab a communicate on your way in. If you could please raise your hand, we'll make sure one is given to you. If you will, go ahead and open up the clear tab on top. We'll do this together. part of our worship where we recognize and honor the death of our Lord and Savior, uh, his body and his blood, which represents the bread, uh, the bread 
and the fruit that we partake of. But we also understand that the penalty for sin is death. And this death is severe, and this death is for eternity. Why did Jesus take on the cruel cross the love of our Heavenly Father? He loves us so much that he gave what was most precious to him. Because there is no man on earth, no matter how famous, no matter how rich, that can save his own soul. This had to come from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the perfect sacrifice. And we honor this sacrifice this morning by praying together as brothers and sisters and honoring this death. Please clear your mind with me. Let's focus on the cross as we go to our Heavenly Father. Most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful day. Father, we humbly continue around thy throne in prayer. Father, give thee thanks for thy love and your mercy. Father, knowing that in order for our souls to be saved, it would require the ultimate sacrifice of your Son. Father, as we partake of this bread, please help us to focus on the cross and the body that was given and suffered there on Calvary's cruel tree. Father, we pray that we partake in a manner that's pleasing in thy sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Pray with me, please. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we continue you around that table in prayer, remembering the sacrifice on the cross and the blood that was shed for the remission of our sin. Father, please help each and one, every one of us to focus on what this sacrifice means and what it conquered. And Father, may each of us partake in a manner that is pleasing and honoring in thy sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When you have finished, if you could place in the back of the pew in front of you, these will be collected after service. Thank you.